Hello, hello. Welcome. I'm Nancy Gardner. I'm so glad you could join me today. We're going to talk about ways to build buyer loyalty today. And it really is surprising to me that for all the years I've been doing this, this still eludes us. We still don't know how to proceed. We, you know, it's, it's a question I get all the time. I've been asked to do complete seminars on reasons buyers buy and how to build loyalty and all that. And, you know, and we don't seem to learn from it or we don't implement what we learn. And, and I'm not real sure why, but we're going to take a look at it today and see if we can't make some headway. So the first thing we want to look at is what do they want? What do they value? And again, this is all there for the taking. But you need to update what you know about them because the online competition is increasing. There are apps all over the place, and they're increasing that will allow people to buy and sell online. And we get scared to death by these things, but at the same time, we don't adapt to, to what we're doing that would help us maintain our role in the transaction and you know buyers and sellers they are self-educating themselves about market conditions long before they contact you and and so it you know we know that but my question is do we prepare for that and that's what i hope that you'll come away with today so I'm going to give you the results of a wave group report. I love the wave group. I, their, their work is, I think, some of the best, if not the best, in our business. And um, this report was put out last October, so this is recent. And I want to explain some of this. Um, buyers want a market smart agent. What does that mean? They want you to know and to use market data. They also want you to keep them informed. Now, if you've listened to my other webinars, then you know that I've been teaching you for years about the importance of sending out monthly market data, local market data every month via email. Well, what this research went on to say was that Mass produced reports do not have an impact, that they, they're too general or they're not local enough, or they talked about some video reports and they said, you know, the video reports, sometimes they, they go into too much information. You remember, keep it simple, okay? And, um, and sometimes it moves through too quickly. You know, the numbers take time to digest. And I know it's easy to do that. I know it's, you know, it's so quick to, you know, give them your charge card and buy something. But if it doesn't have the intended effect, who cares? You're just throwing away your money. And we do that a lot. So, you know, think about this. They do want local market data simplified in ways that, you know, are easy to understand and give them the information they need at that point. You don't want to give, give them everything. I mean, you're not doing an, a market analysis on their property to get it ready to sell. You are just giving them an overview of current market conditions, okay, so that they have an understanding. And what you want to understand is that clients and customers that, that understand, you know, local market dynamics, they make better buyers and sellers. Buyers are my, more likely to know a good deal when they see it. And sellers are going to have a better idea if their house is priced right. So understand that you're not only providing a service for them, you're going to help yourselves in the long run. So that's a market smart agent. And remember what I've also taught you, not just using data, sending data, but also speaking data. When someone asks a simple question, which we all know they do all the time, none of us can ever go anywhere without somebody saying, hey, Nance, how's the real estate market? Okay, that's, I mean, think about how long it's been since I've listed and sold, and I still get that. And you've got to be able to respond with, 
well in Fairfax County at the end of last year, our market was up almost 5% over the year before, and our pricing was up about the same, about 5% uh, as an average from this to this. See how general that is? And yet I gave them the information thereafter. Anything more than that is too deep in the weeds. If they start asking more, just say, well, no, wait a minute. Do you, do you need me to do a market analysis for you? Is that what you're after? Because I, that's going to be very specific to your property. If that's what we, you need, I need to do some research on that for you. Blah, 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 blah. See the difference? Okay. But they also want an agent who is hyper-local. And these two things, market smart and hyper-local, topped their list. They were, this was, this, these two things outpaced anything else on this list. And what they meant by hyper-local was that an agent knew the markets they were listing and selling real estate in. And you know, we all claim to be experts. We're all, oh, blah, blah, blah. And they know we're not. I mean, if, if you normally work in Alexandria, Virginia, and you get a listing or you're working with a buyer who's looking out in, in let's say, Gainesville, Virginia, well, you're 30 or 40 miles difference. And believe me, they're in extremely different markets with extremely different amenities. Okay? And so what they're saying is, I want you to know that. If you're going to show me property there, then I want you to be able to tell me something about that market. Okay? So consider that part of your preparation. The next things they listed... Honesty and integrity. Now, the great thing about this piece of research was that what the Wave Group did, that's why I love them, they're, they really think things through, they, they divided the responses up by age group. Because you know how we all think, you know, that millennials are different from everybody and, you know, Gen Xers and matures, they can't have anything in common. Well, this report kind of showed us something a little bit different. And so when we got to honesty and integrity, the overall a response from buyers was 98% said this was really important to them. And, you know, honesty and integrity, that's something that's, you know, you can't go around and say I'm honest because, you know, if somebody says that to me, I start backing up from them. But it's how we work. It's in those reviews. It's in our data on our production. That tells us whether or not we're honest with people. We're not, if we're buying listings, they're not going to sell, and it'll show up in our data, won't it? So think about it that way. Uh, knowledge of the purchase process, 95% said that that was extremely important to them. Responsive, in other words, you communicate, 94% overall. Now, I will break these percentages down by age group when there is a significant difference. But what I want you to understand is across the board, from millennials to matures, there's one or two points difference here. What I'm giving you are the averages. But overall, there wasn't any difference. They all want the same things. When it came to knowledge of the real estate market, 92%. All right? When it came to communication skills, 89%. Negotiating skills, 86%. People skills, 82%. Knowledge of the local area, 80%. Now, I want you to see what the WAVE group did here. A lot of these overlap, don't they? But they don't I want you to connect the dots. What are you seeing? They want an agent that can work with people, that communicates, and that knows the market. That's what you're seeing here. Now, look at the last one. Skills with technology, which is where we are spending all of our money in this industry. All of our money. I told you a billion and a half dollars last year. Oh, the average was 53% thought that that was, you know, important. And when it came to the millennials, 54%. We have we tend to think that millennials if we if we can't use, you know, the latest thing in technology, they won't work with us. This shows something entirely different. And what I want you to understand is please pay attention to this. But also be specific. Yeah, you can group these together. 
they all kind of follow into those top two categories. All right. What does that mean? How do I nail that down? How do I get specific with it? Another common, common question I get, and this one I, I get a lot, is, you know, what are the reasons that buyers buy? We want to know. It's not because we tell them it's a great time to buy. It is not. So you can shut that self-serving stuff up. They buy based on prices relative to a peak in your market or, or to the last bubble. You know, and if you're in a bubble now, that's going to relate back to your level of employment and the and not only the level of employment, but the quality or the pay scale of the jobs. That's what that means. They also consider home prices relative to construction or replacement costs. If you've got a lot of new construction, sometimes that becomes an obstacle to resale. Because, you know, it's nobody else's dirt. It's all shiny new. They can have input into, you know, the amenities that it has and, you know, have it reflect their taste and preferences. Sometimes the new home construction is so expensive, they don't want it. I mean, it it's varies by market, but they do consider it. Home prices relative to income and rentals. You know, the rental market for years in terms of pricing, because of low rates, low interest rates, it's been, in the long run, more expensive to rent than it has been to buy in terms of the monthly payment. However, what you also have to consider is, are, there, are they credit worthy? You know, there are a lot of people still damaged from the recession that have not really been able to rebuild their credit scores. If they have, have they saved enough to get into a home? You know, what's the at what are the averages there for, you know, upfront costs and down payments? They'll factor that in as well. Some of them don't know, and we're not telling them. I used to think one of the best things we could do on, on uh, open houses was to have a lender do those three ways to finance sheets. Agents I work with, I tell them to do People grab those things up like crazy. You've got a lender that will do them for you. And people like that kind of information. It answers a lot of questions, many of which they're afraid to ask or they're embarrassed to ask. Another reason buyers buy is interest rates. You know, they're still at historic lows. I mean, it, it, uh, any way you slice this, interest rates are low. They may be a little bit higher than, than the bottom, but they're still low. But the most important reason buyers buy is their financial status. Can they afford to buy? That's why all these slogans and jargons and stuff, they come across self-serving because we're not applying them on an individual level. Because we're not interested in, or we don't act like or, or, or demonstrate that we're interested in individual differences. We make blanket statements that may be true for some people, but are not true for all people. And in the end, most of them come across as self-serving. When I say self-serving, I mean self-serving the real estate industry and those of us that work in it. So I want you to think of what the information I've just shared with you is a foundation. to be updated all the time okay because things change we move quickly what you've got are basics to begin that's what you have you have a foundation of knowledge now the other things you want to throw into this remember the new consumer that's the consumer that's mistrustful very knowledgeable remember the research they do okay they're all online before they ever think about contacting you they are uh, they're skeptical and they also know they have options, and that is something that I've talked to you about before. You are going to come face-to-face -face with these options this year because of what's being spent on technology and how it's, it's, it's positioned to be used. And that's why all the other things we've talked about, how your profile is positioned, how your relationships with your sphere need to be consistent and relevant, all of those things are so critical now. 
and they're the only things that will give you leverage against what's coming at us online. All the discounting, all the stuff out there for iBuyers. Why should they use you? They haven't heard from you from six, in six years. Or all you're doing is dropping off candy bars or coffee cards. I mean, come on, people. We handle the largest single financial transaction most people make in a lifetime. Okay? Think about that. Also, an understanding that all professionals qualify. It's how they know how to help us. How can we be afraid of qualifying? When, without it, we really don't know whether or not we can help somebody, whether or not they can, we can do the job they are saying they want us to do. This is so basic, and yet we're scared to death of it. And I really believe that it comes from the fact that we all, most of us began into this with relationship of a relationship base, which still exists. Please don't misunderstand me. It still exists. It's just it's based on different things now. Okay? And that's what you want to understand. All professionals qualify. If you went into a doctor's office and you said, you know, and he said, you know, you know, why are you here? What's going on, Nance? And I said, I'm, I'm having headaches. And I don't know why. And he didn't ask me any questions. He just started writing out a prescription or whatever. I'd be scared to death. I'd be like, wait a minute. You don't know anything about me. You may know me because I've been coming in here for so long, but you don't know anything about what I, I've got going on with me. And that's the same thing we do when we don't qualify, when we don't ask the right questions. Okay. Another thing you want to understand is be prepared to be questioned. It's normal. It is normal. It doesn't mean they think you don't know how to do your job or that you can't help them. It is normal for people to question. But because we've never really been trained on this, how to handle objections, that objections are a normal part of sales, it scares us to death. You know, when some seller says, well, what is your fee? And most sellers go, oh, well, I will charge you 5%. I will give it to you for 5 They don't even wonder why they ask that. They don't even go there. They just assume that all of a sudden they won't work with me unless I reduce my fee, so they jump right there. People, you've got to understand our business. You've got to understand today's consumer. Also, remember that they have options. Okay? They do. They know it. And if you've been an agent that has not communicated in a long time or you did a lousy job in the past, you got some making up to do, and you need to start sooner rather than later. And I don't want to hear that you've been in the business 15 years and that everybody knows you and everybody knows where you are and what you do. That is arrogant, and it is not enough to tell people that you are worthy of their business. It is not. It's arrogant. I, I told this story before when my dentist was re retiring. God, he was great. Um I was sitting there, my last appointment with him before he retired, and I'm sitting out in the waiting room, and I saw him on his monitor. He had scrolling all of his qualifications. I did not know that he graduated magna cum laude from Georgetown. I had no idea. I just thought he was a fabulous dentist. But I had all this stuff, and I went in there, and I said, you know, I, I'm kind of surprised that you would put all that out there. You know, you're, you're out of here in December. And he said, do I not owe the people that come in here to me between now and then an explanation of why they should hire me, of why they should use me? And I thought, I would love to take this man with me when I go on site. I would love for him to tell this story to people that think they don't have to do this. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, yes, we do. And if we don't, somebody will else sell, somebody else will sell them something cheaper. may not be better. But it's cheaper. And then the last thing, you must be able to communicate your value to them. And don't think that they are saying you don't have any when they ask. And as we go through this buyer presentation today, I'm going to show you places and, and, and how you can do that. Okay? So understanding all of this, what they want, reasons they buy, 
and the basics that you really have to understand and have you know internalized in order to begin let's do that let's take a look at what working with today's buyer looks like how does it play out in reality okay buyer pre-appointment questions just like seller pre-appointment questions they are more important than ever now understand you have these handouts you have the buyer pre-appointment questions the buyer appointment you've got a buyer packet and a buyer checklist okay all of that's there for you so you you'll have it you'll print it out you can use it right now you can just listen you can take down any notes that you feel you want to make sure you remember but they are more important than ever okay and what you want to learn to do with them is you want to learn to use them conversationally because when you look at the buyer pre-appointment questions okay you're going to see that you can use them in an open house you can use them with an online prospect you can use them obviously when somebody in your sphere refers you to a buyer and you make a phone call there are a lot of ways to use them and they set the tone okay remember what good questions convey I've taught you this they they show interest they show that you know what you're doing there are reasons behind asking those questions you're not just passing the time of day okay what you want to do and the great thing that having these questions allows you to do you get to listen that's a great thing and we're always you know again I've said this before we're always talking about Q&A Q&A it's Q&L you've got the questions right in front of you listen there may be an additional question that 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 you need to ask because of their answer the questions I've given your guidelines okay it doesn't mean they're the begin all and end all you may have some questions to add to those because of your market conditions or certain things that exist in your market these are your guide this is your template to work from okay and so you want to understand that but if you're not using them you're not studying them you're not practicing them you're not going to understand any of this you're not going to be comfortable with them and the minute somebody's in front of you or on the other end of the phone or the other end of your computer you're going to bond because that's where you're comfortable and you're going to lose because these people already have friends they're looking for a real estate pre professional that is worth the money they're going to pay them and they're very aware of that and of course the pre-appointment questions are your first important step in qualifying the prospect guys you, I don't want you being you know ending up as unpaid taxi cab drivers that's not what you're in business to do but if we don't qualify people we can throw people in our car and that's what we end up being and I know you've all had the experience so focus on their answers what do they tell you about their level of seriousness in this purchase process their level of qualify qualification in this and about what's important to them and the question I want to focus on in the pre-appointment questions there are two there are other questions there but there are two that I want to bring to your attention first off you know what concerns do you have about buying a house in this market that question some of them will say well I really don't have any should I have any just say nope I just like to zero in if somebody has something that they have questions about or concerns I want to know about it up front so I can answer those right away and put your mind at ease before we go through everything else and then most of the time they'll say I don't want to overpay and that's where you'll say let me explain how I handle that for my buyer clients when you decide there's a property that you'd like to make an offer on I will do a pricing analysis again I would prefer you do an absorption rate if you're not using absorption rate then you're going to go back to your old CMAs which in my opinion are way too narrow um, but you're going to do a pricing analysis to show you how that property is positioned price wise against its competition you'll know whether or not it's a good value 
whether it's overpriced or a steal. You're going to know that before you make an offer because I will take you through that. It's the same information, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I would give to a seller if I were their listing agent. See that? Buyers love that because I've got agents that do that, and they love it. So you want to understand that, okay? You know, you're learning what's important to them. The other um Questions are important, have to do with their being able to qualify, you know, and this is huge, and whether or not they have a lender. And when they say they have a lender, please, please listen to who they've hired. If it's somebody online, what do you know about them? Okay, uh, you know, do they bait and switch? Do they deliver? Does the buyer talk to somebody different every time they call in with a question or email with a question? What are they getting? You know, and a great question is, do you know that lender's loan application to uh, close of loan ratio? Because I will tell you, if you feel you'd like to talk to another lender, I have a couple of very good lenders who get the job done and they get it done on time in our market. It's absolutely what you feel you need at this point. If you don't know that, you you know you may find a very different reality from what you've been promised. I like my clients to have options. I'd be happy to have somebody call you. And remember, look to what I just said. I don't want you giving them a name and number and telling them to call. I want you working with somebody in mortgage that understands service, that also understands the craziness that people go through when they're thinking of buying and selling, you know, they, they every their their realities go out the window, and that you know they get agitated, and you need to have somebody step in and say, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, you know, this is this is Sam Jones. I'm a loan officer with ABC Mortgage. I believe Nancy Gardner told you that I would be phoning you. How can I help? There you go. Now, we know they can all do their loan apps online, but they've already done that with somebody. We need somebody that's going to talk to them, that's going to help them make sense of what they're getting ready to get into. And we all know that even though they think they know, they do not know what they're getting ready to take on. So don't forget to use those. Okay. Now, let's say we've gone through all this. Okay, and we are, we've got an appointment, so what do we do? All right, you've got all this in writing in front of you, but at the initial appointment, this is where you give them an overview, and this is really important because what you want to understand is everything you do all the way through from the first contact on down to closing either builds credibility and trust with you or it diminishes it. So it's all important. It all matters. One of the best things you can do to begin is to go through the process and market and finance conditions using data. They need to understand what they're going through. Some of you are in incredibly, incredibly strong markets. Days on market is, I mean, Lord, some of you have 12 days on the market. Some of you have 22 days on the market. I mean, you have no inventory and everything flies off the shelf. Well, buyers may understand that they're in a buyer's mar uh, a seller's market, but they may not understand to what extent. And that's where, again, you'll use your data. And I always tell people, when, especially when you're in a strong market, that's where the average days on market really comes in. And the way you frame it is an urgency index. This is in your handout, okay? This is an urgency index. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, well-priced properties in our market go under contract in an average of 12 days. So what the reason I'm saying this to you is I don't want you to fall in love with something and think you have time. Think that you can go out and look at everything else and it'll still be there. I, it might be. I can't promise that. And I, I just want you to understand what you're up against right now. 
99.8% of the listings on the market sell here. And they sell in an a market average is about 21 days. For my listings, it's 12 days because of how I price and how I market. So I want you to understand what you're up against. If there are any financial considerations, is everything pricing? Has anything gotten tougher or eased in terms of what they their credit scores in terms of qualifying? You know, all of that stuff is stuff they need to know. And don't count on a lender to have told them unless you know that lender. But it doesn't hurt for them to hear it again. Okay? I explained you're going to go through absorption rate pricing or pricing counseling or pricing analysis counseling to position their offer. When we get to where you want to make an offer, don't remember what I said. I'm going to do a pricing analysis on that property before you make an offer so that you'll know whether or not this is a well-priced property or it's overpriced or whatever. You're going to know where that property stands. I'm not going to let you go into this blind. All right? Then you're going to go through the buyer needs analysis. Okay? This is what you're going to cover. And the buyer needs needs analysis is where you're going to ask them questions about their preferences. Okay? Now, really important when you're working with somebody from out of the area because their reality on buying may be very different. Also, it can be different on building materials. It can be different on um, uh, requirements, disclosures, uh, agency. It can be different across the board. And you really want to want to be, be make sure you, you're you're covering all of this when you're working with somebody from out of the area. Now, that doesn't mean if you're working with a local that they don't want to tell you all this. Okay, and even when you're in a really hot market. A lot of them want the opportunity to tell you so that they feel like you know what's important to them, that you're not just a number, okay, that's getting in line, you know, for the next house that's available. Let them, you know, let them talk. And when they talk, when you take them through the questions, again, those questions are a template. If there are things in your market that you need to address via these questions, please add them in. Okay, but the most important thing you want to understand when you're going through these questions is listening. Listening to their answer. And making sure that you understand. That's when you probe. That's when you ask an additional question. And oh, by the way, I haven't mentioned this. Please, when you're sitting down with them, it is all right to sit down with this presentation right in front of you to ask questions that are on those pages right in front of you, okay? Because when you write down someone's answers, what you are communicating to them silently is that what you're telling me is important and I'm paying attention. So don't feel like you have to memorize every bit of this. Memorize the pre-appointment questions to go memorize anything. They're the ones you want to be able to ask at the drop of a hat when the opportunity or the situation arises. But when you get to sit down with somebody in an actual appointment, you can be a little more structured. That's okay. I mean, I'm sorry, but don't doctors write down what we tell them? Don't attorneys? Don't accountants? If yours don't, you better switch because they can't remember it. Maybe they're taping it. They can do that. But at any event, somebody better be, you know, taking notes because... People don't remember all this, and that's what you communicate when you do that. Um, and it's okay to say, okay, could you tell me a little more about that? Okay, now, in our market, that means this. Is, is that what that means to you? Is that how you define that? We all know. If, you're, if you don't know, you haven't been in sales very long. We define words differently, and we define words differently based on our experiences and sometimes how we were educated and where we're from or whether we're male and female. Good salespeople understand this, and they're not afraid of questions. Questions and answers become their new best friend. The next thing you'll do is you'll pre present agency.
okay? And what you'll do is you'll present how their options for representation as it exists in your state. Every state is different, okay? That's why I can't teach you one way or the other. Now, what I want you to understand there is that when you present it, you want to be very careful to present in a way that they understand. And what they've said over and over again, and guys, when they're surveyed on the agency, they really come in strong wanting to know more about this. And what they said about it was they believe that agency represented their rights in the transaction. And we know how consumers are about their rights today, so don't overlook this. Okay, and I've had top agents stand up and say, well, once you can explain my state, please teach them to me because I don't have a clue. She's the top agent in the company. She's no longer in business, but I'm just saying, you know, don't take this for granted because consumers don't. You know, they're all about their rights. And so when you explain it, please, no legalese. We're not, we're not listening for the party of the first part. We're listening for... When I represent you in this capacity, this is what I can do. This is what I cannot do. And you explain, this is the law as it exists in my state. You didn't write this. These aren't your fault. You're following the law. You want people to understand that. A lot of times they think our license law is something that we put up there to, you know, self, to serve us and not them, not to protect them. Because we don't explain it. We don't explain it. So make sure you do that. And again, then, if you are seeking to represent the buyer, this is where you ask. Now, when agency first came to Virginia, Here's what I taught my agents. So I was a big believer in it from the very beginning. It came into our state in the, I think it was late 80s. And what I taught my agents to do, and you, you know, it may work for you as well if, it's, if this is a difficult topic. I mean, we all know we can do a better job, a more thorough job, if we represent our clients, okay? And so what you can do if they're uncertain. Now, I also want you to see, look where you're asking. This is important. You're asking to represent them pretty much in the same place that you would be asking the seller to sign the listing agreement, okay, after you'd gone through the presentation, which is what we've done here, okay? I mean, obviously, I've abbreviated it, but that's what you've done. And so now you're asking. I mean, none of us walk in the door with the seller and say, here's the listing agreement you can sign right here. We give a presentation. I don't know why we think buyers don't deserve the same thing. It's, it's crazy when you think about it, you know, and so here's where you'd ask. Now, again, if they're hesitant or whatever, all right, what you want to understand, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Mm. It's all this hot air coming out of my mouth, um, is give them an option. This is what I used to teach my agents to do. And I'd say, look, we're going to work together this weekend. And what I'd like to do, and in my state we signed an agreement, a right to represent. I said, what I'd like to do is go ahead and work with you this weekend uh, representing you. Because I can give you more information. I can, I can give you, do a more thorough job. Um, but what we'll do is we'll have this expire at midnight Sunday night. If I'm not the right agent for you, if either one of us don't feels that we don't work well together, we're done. But through this process, until Sunday night at midnight, you have an agent representing your interest and all the information they provide. And, you know, and so that worked beautifully. And my agents were so well trained that we – we represented our buyers an extraordinary percentage of the time. So understand it's a great way to do it if you're uncomfortable. And generally, if you know what you're doing and, 
and you know and understand you could also find yourself working with a lunatic or somebody you don't want to work with you can always end it at the end of of, of the weekend if you so desire it's completely up to you or them but it's a mutual decision okay and then you're gonna you know do any confirmation of loan approval that you need to do at this point you get do your MLS search uh, again, offer of representation, and then you're going to discuss showings. Now, the technology for this varies in different parts of the country. Some people will go through a lot of things uh, in the conference room on their monitors. They have big, you know, obviously uh, television monitors where they can take people through properties, and when you have a lot of inventory, that's sometimes helpful uh, because buyers did say that they would like agents who have seen the property before they show it to them. Okay. In other words, they're tired of you taking them through things they have no interest in. You need to do your job and preview, and you need to do it more than after a sales meeting when somebody's going to feed you chicken salad in order to get you to go through the inventory. We need to know what we're selling. Preview. And if you're smart, you'll preview on your way into the office, and you'll preview on your way home, and you'll track your mileage, and it's deductible. Or not. Another thing, again, um, I used to teach my agents, show the area first, show neighborhoods, show amenities, show schools, things like that, especially if they're not familiar with the area. You know, when you're dealing with somebody from out of town, you know, and I've been that person a couple of times in my life, you know, what we go in saying is, I want to see everything. And we want to see everything because we don't know where we want to live. When I lived in Boston, you know, I... We narrowed down neighborhoods, and, I, and so when I, you know, met with the agent, I said, I want you to show property in Winchester, in Lexington, and Wellesley, okay? So narrowed it right down and made everybody's job easier because I'd done some research on this. You know, my kids were in school then, and I'd done the research on that and the proximity to Boston and what was in the town and all that good stuff, you know, and that was difficult back then because it wasn't all online. But I dug it out. We had some friends that lived up there, and they gave us, a, you know, a lot of information, etc. So that can help you a lot. It's people pick where they want to live first, then they choose their house, and a lot of it and that has to do with their priorities: commute, schools, and we ask all about that in the um, in the um, uh, needs analysis. So you're going to have information on that. Okay, that'll help you in showings, but it helps you to, to narrow it down. All right. So now we go out and we show property based on what they've told us. Sometimes you'll show property that same day. Sometimes you'll make an appointment to show property depending on, you know, the, the time that's allowed. Now, this is important. After you've shown, think about all the research, all the homework you've done with these people. All right, if you've shown them six to eight houses, again, depending on market conditions, but they've not seen anything they like, sit down with them again. I don't care if you stop and get a cup of tea or, or whatever. Just say, you know, I'm concerned. We've looked at six to eight houses. You're not seeing anything you like. So what I want to ask you, have I missed something? Or have your priorities changed, which happens all the time. That's why we're always saying buyers are liars, because they think they know till they get in the market and see what their money will actually buy or what an area actually looks like as opposed to their perception of it. And it changes. They shut down. I don't want to live here. I don't want to buy this. I thought I'd get this and this, which in our market means you got to go further and further out to get it. Okay, so. That is huge. If I could count how many times agents have come to me, clients have said, I changed agents because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. She'd been so nice and she'd showed me so many things, but we really did, you know, we really weren't seeing what we liked. If you've done this much work with them, Okay, that, remember those are the agents that throw people in their car. To, remember what they used to train on until they buy or die? I can't believe that. I still remember that. Um, you know, that's what happened. Don't let that happen to you. Do your job. It's the same thing as a doctor saying, I want you to take this medication for two weeks. I 
want you to come back and I want you to see, I want to see how this is working. And if it isn't working, we'll make some adjustments. That's what he's doing. He's getting feedback. That's what you're doing, getting feedback. Okay. Then you're going to write the offer. You're going to present it. You're going to negotiate, hopefully, using the absorption rate pricing analysis on how you came to that price point. Okay. You're going to go over the contract to closing events. Spend some time. Again, this is a great place. You know, and I've got it down here, your contract to closing guidelines. It's a great place for a video or, at the very least, a PowerPoint presentation, okay, where they know what happens after, what next. That's really what you're telling them, and they get really nervous. But another thing I want to point out here, this home inspection renegotiation, that's very important that you spend time on. There's a lot of business falling through the cracks right now because it blows up in the home inspection. Another place for data, okay? If you are seeing within your office, you know, 20% of the transactions are falling through because of, nego of um, home inspection issues, then you need to tell that buyer that. A lot of them don't realize that when you open it up for a home inspection, and of course you want them to have one, and of course you're going to have them hire a home inspector, okay? But you said, I want you to under explain this process because what this means is, is that this uh, uh, whole contract that you have may fall through because we're really opening it up and renegotiating it based on that home inspection. Now, the home inspection is for, you know, you know you're buying a resale. This is not a brand new home, but it's to tell you how to use all the systems in your house, you know, when the filters need changing, how many years you have on the roof, things like that. If you come across something, you know, major, then we'll, of course, ask the seller to address it. That's the renegotiation. But right now, over 20% of the transactions in, just in our office, and this is happening across the MLS, are falling through because people couldn't come to an agreement. If you feel strongly enough about it, that's absolutely fine. I will negotiate that in your behalf. But I don't want you to, to not realize what can happen and then go, oh, my God, we lost the house. Okay? I just want you to understand. Use data on this. Use data. Now, another thing I've got here is an in-depth HOA inquiry. And what that means in the areas, the markets that have HOAs or POAs or all of that is during the recession, uh, there were an extraordinary number of properties that were distressed. And uh, people, you know, we called them early walkers. They threw the keys on the countertop and they left. And the HOA had to take on the maintenance of those properties. They had to cut the grass, take care of the upkeep. And they took care of that. And then they passed the cost along to the homeowners in an assessment. Um, that still goes on, all right? We are, there are some markets that are starting to see more distressed properties show up. And some of us believe that they never really went away, but that bank owned, they just pulled them off until they saw that they could sell them and get some of their money back. And so whatever the reasons for it, um, an in-depth HOA inquiry, which can show you, you know, upcoming assessments and all of that, is in many instances a, a, in your client's best interest. Then if your transaction management exists online, you want to explain that to them. Again, contract to closing guidelines, at least PowerPoint. I think it's a great place for a video. It's up to you. And then your follow-up guidelines. And what I mean by that is telling them when they will hear from you. Now, obviously, you know, weekly is a minimum. An absolute minimum, and it's what you're saying to them is I'm going to, you know, I'll let you know or, or the transaction department will let you know as these things um, occur, and, uh, and I'll be in touch if anything comes up. But beyond that, I'm going to check on you, in on you once a week to make sure that you're, you know, you found a mover, you're packing your boxes, and that everything's okay. So you're going to hear from me. It doesn't mean something's wrong. It means I'm just checking in on you. Um, so, and also, by the way, if you have transaction coordination in your brokerages, 
you know, and these people, again, some of them function differently. Um, but if this is somebody that really takes over the administrative aspects of the sale, I believe that those transaction people should have business cards and that you should give that business card out to that buyer and at, at the time and say, now, Susie's going to be calling you as soon as she gets this file and in, she'll introduce herself and um, make sure you know how to contact her should anything come up about this and this. That gives them a comfort level that Susie is an actual living human being and that she is paying attention to their file, which, is, which increases the likelihood that they'll talk to that person and take those administrative tasks off of you. So, you know, there are ways to do this to make it more effective. And then, hopefully, you skipped along to a very, you know, smooth and um, wonderful closing. But what I also recommend is that a month after closing, you make that sphere of influence call. And I don't care if they were already in your sphere or they're in your sphere now because they are a past client. You make this call. They know you've already cast your check. They don't think they're going to hear from you again. And this is where you say, hey, guys, it's Nance just checking in. Want to make sure you love the house, that everything's going well, and that you don't need anything at this point. Also want to make you aware, I, I will start to send you next month market data on our local market via email. I just send it once a month it's so you can keep up with what's going on. If you have any questions or you don't want to see anything related to real estate for a while, just let me know, and I'll take care of it. You take good care. That's it. It goes such a long way. This stuff matters. This matters. People skills, communication, all that stuff that we started off with. We've covered it all in this. But it won't benefit you if you don't use it. Remember, you are relearning things you thought you already knew. And things, you know, with buyers, they can be habits before we know it. And habits are harder to break, so you'll have to practice. You know, practice in your car. I'm always saying that. You can really hear yourself. It's, it's a pretty great echo chamber. You know, how do you sound? Practice in office training. That's what training simulation is for. So you can practice. So you can make all your mistakes and laugh at each other in the office. When you get out in the, in the field, you nail it. You're fabulous at it. And remember, continuing to learn. Practicing, all of that is a part of being a successful professional and understanding that successful people never, ever take their success for granted. They're always looking to update. They're always looking to adapt. Always, always looking to be better at what they do. That's what I'm asking of you, and that's what today's consumer expects. So good luck with this. I hope it answers a lot of your questions and, and uh, makes working with buyers actually easier and more productive for you. Take good care. Be safe out there, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.